Hey, what's going on, everybody? Mike Sparacino here. Pucks and Brews, episode five, at least I think. And uh, we are joined today by our buddy, Liam, Liam Gottimer. And as always, we got Brandon Woj, no, aka Woj. And uh, first of all, Liam, how are you doing? I'm doing very well. It's good to be uh, on Pucks and Brews for the first time ever. Obviously, uh, it's disappointing that Brendan couldn't be here uh, with us tonight, but I will try to be as good as a replacement as I possibly can. Yeah, Brendan, uh, he was hanging out with uh, Kako and, you know, he got COVID protocol list. So we he didn't want to take the chance of virtually transmitting COVID to us. So he's taking one for the team right now. Yeah, and he, may, he might have too, for all we know. I don't and know. he gets to hang out with Kako Kako and Keandre Miller. So, you know, he, he has it good. I didn't, Most didn't think there. I was actually going to say that. <laughs> that was a joke. Really. I didn't think you were serious. But, yeah, he's been hanging out with he's been hanging out with the pros too much. And he knows he can't be around him, but he, he doesn't care. He's putting his safety behind a back seat. He's, he's partying with them. It doesn't matter to him. Oh, hey, dude, he's hanging out with a rock star. Rock star shit. Oh, yeah. If he, if Brendan actually listens to this back and he, he's going to be so mad, but I'm going it, to, oh, it's so good. But uh, unfortunately we have bad news to talk about first, you know, cause our Temi Panarin had to take a leave of absence from the team, unfortunately, because of uh, something with the Russian government and recent political views of his. So uh, the one word I can sum this up in or pain. What are your what are your thoughts, Liam? Well, I would say expected. And, you know, obviously we didn't expect this report to come out, but with everything that surrounded the Rangers starting this year, you just knew that, you know, once your best player, Panarin, got back from injury, that he was just going to be taken away from us uh, in some fashion. And look, I don't want to get into talking about the Russian government and what goes on over there. And those ab- those allegations, they seem fabricated. And the fact that the Rangers, you know, solely – uh, stand by or Temi Panarin and things seem to be getting better is good. Uh, but losing Panarin when the team is actually playing better as of late, which we'll get into is not good. So. Yeah. As one of the guys who's actually been consistent, like quiet, but like he's been getting points every single game he's in it. You may not notice him some nights, but he's still on the, on the score sheet. Um, it's just, it's crazy how it comes out 10 years later or, or something like that. And to think that like, all right, well, it's something not good if it's true, but it, it's obvious. I'm, I think it's obviously false. I mean, everyone said so as coaches, guys who played on the, the team with at the time in uh, Fitias, they said it wasn't true. It never happened, but they're just, you know, trying to cut out, come at him after his political views and, and trying to put him in a box and just uh, just mess with him. And it's, it sucks, especially it's expected though from this season, like anything could go wrong, can go wrong. Yeah, I saw something. Um, I forget where I saw it. It was probably on Twitter, but I forgot who. Uh, he said it was apparently a two-week leave that Panarin asked for, which, I mean, we, I don't really know how true that is, but I'm hoping it's only two weeks. I mean, the sooner this team gets him back, the better. My question is, can he clear his name in two weeks? You know, I mean, I feel like there's so many facts that have to come out about this story that didn't come out in the initial one. So I think it's really a waiting game. Look, if it's two weeks, that's best case scenario. Yeah, I think it was the two weeks for, I think, just to get his family safe or to contact them or or something exactly around that. um, Around that. But I mean, it's funny that like no one's mentioned like the girls never come out and said anything about it. It's all speculation from from their side, from the news sources. But I think it's the two weeks to so he can contact his family and stuff. But yeah, it's we'll have to see. No one really knows right now. Probably longer. I wouldn't be surprised. Let's, yeah. let's just hope Panarin himself does not go back to Russia because oh, yeah. they'll they'll, they'll, they'll be they'll be waiting. Yeah, yeah he's not making wanna, it back. If he, you, he you don't want to mess with them. But uh, let's move on to uh, slightly better, but still pretty bad news. Uh, Capo Caco, unfortunately, got added to the COVID-19 list again. And Keandre Miller also got added to the list within the past 48 hours. So more pain. But uh, like Liam said, this is just whatever is going to go wrong is just going wrong. And this just stinks. 
it's literally the two players that you didn't want to go on the COVID protocol list, right? I mean, you have Panarin, who goes out for some, um, something related, nothing to do with COVID. And then you lose Kako, who has been picking up his game, actually looking in his first time in his career, looking like a legit top six forward. Then he gets taken away. And Keandre Miller, who is so pivotal to that back end. I, I don't know about you guys. I like Anthony Potato. I can't stand watching him. <laughs> and yeah, Libor right. Hayek and Jack Johnson, it's going to give me a brain aneurysm. So, I think Jack Johnson alone might give me one, <laughs> let alone the other two. Hayek looks so good his first like few games. What do you play? Like, um, he played a couple the last last year, or the year before, and he got hurt. But um, yeah, it's tough watching that back end. Keandre Miller. I don't think anybody expected him. Maybe a few people expected him to be that good out of camp, but um. He, he's a big part to the defense and, and Kako actually like, like you said, like picking up his game, he looks like a, a dominant top six player. And just for that to happen, I know he was on it earlier in the year, but that was just a protocol just to, just to make sure. Cause he might've been in contact with somebody, but it seems like this time he might actually uh, have it since he's missed more of the game. Yeah. Um, I was reading Rick Carpinello's article and he basically explained it. You're on the COVID protocol list for three reasons. One, you actually have it. Two, it was something along the lines of, uh, uh, what was it? It might've been like salary cap thing to, I don't remember exactly. Or three, he might be injured, but being on the list doesn't necessarily mean you have it, which I hope he doesn't because I mean, like we all said, he was on a tear earlier in the season and Liam you put it perfectly he's actually looking like a top six forward which is something this team desperately needs especially now that Panarin's not currently with the team I mean yeah I mean you summed it up perfectly I mean the depth scoring just simply isn't there and that's perfectly exemplified by what happened against Philadelphia last night you know Chris Kreider is the main reason for all three of your goals and uh, it's pretty much coming on the power play on special teams so look they need other guys to step up, but the Rangers are in a really tough spot. Like you could argue to start this season outside of the goaltending, their three top players, maybe outside of Adam Fox as well are out right now. And any team is going to struggle like that. So, Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's tough. Like you said, when the team struggles, a lot of people look at the coach and, and they're like, Oh, they're going out of his head, which I mean, it's tough when you're missing so many guys and especially in a year like this, um, I don't know if the guy's in a wake up call or something, but it, I don't think it's necessarily on the coach himself. Cause like in Chicago, Jeremy Carlton, no, I, from what I heard, not a lot of fans liked him. And then yet he's able to get this team with only Kane and DeBrinket to, to just go off and have a good season so far. If they need something else. If it's the injuries and everything else going around, not, you know, waking them up, something's going to have to. And, um, like I said, it's, it's tough, especially with what's going on now that so many injuries and everybody's out every other game. You know, they, they really need to find something to spark the team. And I don't think you can blame Quinn for that game last night. No. I, mean, I don't know about you guys, but if Panarin and Keandre Miller are in that game in the starting lineup, they win that game. I I think so. They had so many chances. If it's not for Colin Blackwell missing an open net in the first period, then maybe uh, we went to OT. So Yeah, he's, he's taken after Ryan Strom now, who apparently can only score a goal from the point with like seven players in front, but he can't hit a wide open net to save his life. But uh, all right. Well, five Ranger games have passed since we last recorded. And unfortunately three of them are losses, but just to take uh, some things away from all five games, the first game against Boston, where I actually, or when, when was the first game against Boston? You said the date, February 12th. Well, yeah. So February 12th, I mean, from what I remember, and based on my notes, they actually played pretty well that first period, and then injuries in the second period basically killed them the rest of the game. Yeah, it was a one nothing loss. It was a good game. Um, only, only two bad things about it. Like like we said, we stick with them the entire time. Anytime you can hold Boston to a one nothing lead, you know, throughout a game is is pretty good. Um, but they were 0 for 6 on the power play. Um, and the only category they led in was hits. I mean, so, I, I remember this being a very 
gritty game and yeah. quite frankly a defensive masterpiece on both ends and the, if you guys remember the one goal that beat Shesterkin by Nick Ritchie who by the way ha- just has that face Nick Ritchie has that face that yeah. you look at him and you just want to sock him right in the head and I don't know about you guys but the fact that he scored the only goal in that game in a one nothing shutout just really grinds my gears to quote Peter Griffin but look <laughs> tough game <laughs> Uh, there was a lot of fights. I think this was the fight with Frederick and Lemieux where they got, where they just went at each other uh, right off the draw there. But again, played good hockey, only got 21 shots on goal and you can't win if you can't score. So. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't, if that isn't the moral of the season, then I really don't know what is, but uh, just another key takeaway from the game. The penalty kill was perfect again in that game for at that point in the season, 17 straight kills, which over the last five games, including that one, that's not including the past actual four games, just that, you know what I mean? But uh, Kako and Lafreniere, I remember having good nights, which was fantastic, looking really good. And uh, that was about it. Yeah, like Liam said, very intense game. So, oh yeah, that also, you want to know what I have in my notes here? The pregame rock, paper, scissors between Marshan and Zabanajad. Oh. <laughs> you know, guys, I thought when Zabanajad won that, I thought the Rangers were going to win the game. I thought that was a telltale sign that the Rangers were going to win, but just not yeah. to be. Well, it, it was a, it was a moral victory. I mean, dude, rock, paper, scissors, that shit gets intense. Trust me, I know. <laughs> and and anytime you're beating Brad Marshand is a good time, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's true. And but of course, leave it to friggin' Halak to shut us out because, of course, uh, I also took down the note. Uh, it was a bad goal by Shesterkin because he didn't hug the post, which unfortunately yeah, it, it was. Too. But you know, if you don't score a goal, you're not gonna win a game, period. And a uh, little bit piece of news after the game Chris Drury was named the GM for the 2021 U.S. men's national team. So congrats to him. Yep. And uh, let's move on to the game against the Devils, which is another game we would all probably want to forget. That was a 5-2 loss where David Quinn even might have said, like, this might have been worse than the season opener against the Islanders. And I, it's definitely in contention, but I don't know if I would put that as the worst game because we actually scored. But uh Here's some of my notes. It was the seventh time in 14 games where the Rangers scored two or less. Not going to win you games. Uh, Truba was injured either early second or late second period. He didn't play in the third because of a upper body injury, which I think was confirmed to be a broken thumb after the fact. Right, Liam? Broken thumb. Yep. Four to six weeks. Ugh. Miller and Panarin were also out that game. Uh, Kreider got into an early fight. And of course, that didn't spark the team at all. Uh, that, I actually remember that being a good game from Hayek. And Colin Blackwell is scoring more goals than Mika Zibanejad. <laughs> I mean, this was at a time where the Rangers were just scoring no goals. Remember, they're coming off that game where they got shut out by Halak and the Bruins. And look, I don't know if you guys remember, it's a 2-2 tie after the second period going into the third. There is some hope here. You know, they ended up putting 37 shots on goal, which is a good thing. Uh, but that goal by Sharon Govich, then Merkley, and then once it was 4-2, you just knew it was over and you can just shut it off. So Yeah. yeah. I think it was the game. I think uh, Blackwood, I mean, we weren't as great. At least we got 37 shots. This is amazing. But but one of, that's one of those games where Blackwood gets just steals it. It's where the other goalie just goes off and he and he's able to um just solely alone like their offense got it done but uh, a few good things is that it was almost 50 and 50 in, in face offs so that part was getting a little bit better and like you said we did lead in shots but it just looks like one of those games where it was, wasn't going our way at, at a certain point point in time like you said two to two it started to get away from us yeah that was just one of those games where like when you're done watching it you just feel like going into the game the team was taking a step forward and then that game happens and then it's just you just go right back down as a fan and this is the second time the devils have done this to us this season remember we played them right after we played the islanders they beat us in a similar game so i don't know devils might have our number boys yeah if but we you can watch- get one win against them soon i'll take it at this point yeah going into this year i thought like 
especially them having that week off, I was like, you know, I was like, maybe there's a chance that we'll be, uh, I mean, we're better than last year, but you know, maybe at least this year we'll get a, we'll get a step on them, but they've come out hot and they look, they look pretty good so far this year. And also to note on this game, you know, this was the game where the Devils were coming off of their COVID outbreak. So they were, they were well rested. Yes, but they have not seen NHL ice, you know, in a pretty long time and they still kicked their ass. So. Yeah. yeah, I'm actually glad you brought that up because I actually forgot about that. What is with the Rangers and just coming out super flat against teams that haven't played in two weeks? Like, you, yes, you can put some blame on the coach, but after a while, you got to start blaming the players for not being ready by puck drop. Yeah. And, hey, look, Kreider tried, right? He got off to that fight right off the faceoff draw, and like you said, it just didn't work. Nobody else had that energy, and, I mean – yeah, just just disappointing. I'd like to move on from this game. The only thing left that I have to say about this game is Buchnevich throwing the monkey off his back. That's why I love him because ah, uh, fucking love the guy. And I, I know I know you don't love him, Liam, but I mean, come on, you gotta admit that was great. Hey, hey, Buchnevich has proven me wrong this season. Why does my Legit phone top six ring forward. right now? <laughs> I will I will sit on my words. I will be perfectly honest which never just been impressive and uh you know we need him and we need Zibanejad to you know really pick it up as a line so I yeah. apologize for my phone ringing if the viewers at home or you Didn't guys hear it, it but uh hear it. The, the thing rings all day every day and it, oh Jesus you wouldn't believe the amount of anger well anyway about about Buchnevich I just the only good thing he has going for him is he kind of looks like Brendan I think you mean that's only the positive. only good thing Brendan has going for it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he looks exactly like Brendan, dude. Yeah, they look similar. Very, I should, very close. I should change Brendan's name <laughs> in my phone to Brendan Molnevich. Yeah, it's his name. He legally has to get a change. We have to take him to the um, DMV, get his license changed, all of it, get it fixed. If he that's does him, that, huh? I will buy him beers for like a year. But he won't. So. No, he won't do it. And then we go out, or then we go out, then we move on. I don't know where the go out came from to the- Yeah, it's uh, a pandemic, dude. You can't go anywhere. Stay home. I mean, you can go right outside your house and shovel snow when it snows, but I mean, that's yeah. that's about it. Then we move on to the first game against the Flyers in this five-game span we're talking about. And we actually won. I Even after watching this game, I was confused as all hell that we actually won because Miller was out still. Truba was diagnosed with a four to six weeks injury. He was still out. Smith got back in the lineup. So did Johnson. At this point, I wanted to put my head through a wall, not in a good way, but Panarin did get back in. Gautier was a healthy scratch. Adam Fox was a monster. And Mika, it was playing so bad in this recent stretch up to that point that he actually got taken off the power play and I was forced like for sure I thought we were losing this game and then they won and I was literally sitting there confused but kind of happy but more confused than anything what about you guys well I I think the Flyers scored in the first minute of that game uh, if I'm not mistaken net front scramble then, you know, Blackwell gets a goal. Then of all people, right, Brendan Smith gets a goal. You know, your defenseman jumping up into the play and depositing an empty net. And, boys, I don't know about you. I mean, we can go back to earlier in the game, but when Joel Farabee tied the game with a minute and a half left, oh, you yeah. just you just knew that was going to happen, right? Yeah. And, you know, you saw the play. I saw the play, and I was like, oh, maybe they have something for goaltender interference there. No, nothing. Just ripped it right away. I thought we were going to get a win, but, of course, not. And, of course – Kevin Hayes is the one who shot that puck because he loves to torture us Ranger fans, as we will get to. So, Yeah, that was a good, good shit at one. I mean, that's one of those ones where you're, you're lucky you have skillful guys, especially when it comes to that situation where you can, you can win. And, and Philly has a lot of good guys too, but um, I don't want to say it's luck. It was, it was, it was good two to two up until the end. Though you said they let in that goal by, by Faraby, but um, you know, luckily we got it done the shootout and we got the extra point. So to so all that matters really. And I don't know if you guys noticed, but Panarin and Kako scored in the shootout the exact same shot on yeah. Carter Hart, the exact same place right in between the blocker and his arm there. And, uh, got us the shootout win. Thank goodness. We needed that. So. 
Oh, yeah. What is what is that called? The new five hole, the seven hole? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hey, dude, if it works, keep doing it. But, uh, dude, Adam Fox played, what was it? 30 minutes and 17 seconds in that game, which was the most the Ranger has, has logged in ice time since Brendan's boy, Dan Girardi, in November 2013, I think. 24. No, wait a second. Yeah, it was November 2014. It didn't. I didn't get the uh, time on ice already played, but uh, up to that point, Fox logged 24 minutes and 52 seconds of average ice time of the 13 games up to that point in the season. 12 of 13, including that game, which is just insane. Yeah, he right before our eyes is developing into a number one defenseman. I said on the penalty box, you know, a couple episodes, how many number one defensemen do you really see in the NHL? The number one defenseman on a Stanley Cup winning team. I think Adam Fox can be that. And that's high praise. What do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, give, give him a comparison. I'd go uh, John Carlson, hopefully in the next few years, or at least that dominant. I mean, it took him a little bit to get to, get to that level. But, I mean, right out the gate, he's been he's looked really good. I'm actually – Liam, I completely forgot to uh, mention your podcast on the uh, on the intro because that's okay. No you know, worries. I'm I'm just stupid. But uh, before I go any further in this podcast, everybody, please make sure to check out the Penalty Podcast on iTunes as well as some other pod podcast platforms. And Liam, tell us about your newer podcast, uh, Game Day. Re I actually I forgot the name of your fucking. Uh, the post game podcast yep. review. I actually took a little bit of a break from it uh, while the school year is going on. So the penalty box is the main one right now. Me and a good friend of mine talk all things NHL. So check that out podcast platforms, but let's get back to Adam Fox. Cause that's, what's more important. Uh, Woj, I like your comparison for John Carlson. If you just had that size that Carlson had, I yeah. would agree with you, but play style. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. You guys want to move on to the game against the Capitals? Yeah. All right. Just some notes I took down. The Rangers actually had a good faceoff percentage that game of 57%. Yeah. Zabanajab won 15 of eight. The only thing that was pretty much bad about this game is the first 14 minutes where the Rangers only got three shots on goal, which included a power play that did not have a shot on goal. Uh, and, but after that, the game was pretty much – very good game for the Rangers. Kreider scored on the power play. Do you see what happens when you shoot the puck? Panarin shoots it. A rebound is right there. Kreider, tap in. Shoot the fucking puck. <laughs> what a concept, right, Chades? Oh, yeah. I know. It's fuck this earth-shattering news. <laughs> so the other positives were Lafreniere scored his second goal of the season off of a feed from Panarin who Lafreniere actually had an underrated move right in front of the net. He had to stop. He brought that to his back end and not roofed it, but he put it over the pad, which was, that was lovely to see. Hopefully this can get him going a little bit, but I'm not going to put too much pressure on him because he's still 19 years old. Yeah, don't do that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not some you. people on Twitter. <laughs> All those people know who they are. Luckily, none of our friends. But uh, that interesting stat about Lafreniere's second goal. He is the first Ranger to score his first two NHL goals as game-winning goals since Kreider did it in the 2012 playoffs and the first Ranger to do it in the regular season since Sergei Nemchinov in 1991. So this is a very rare occurrence and... Basically, you love to see it. And Strom, like I said earlier in the podcast, scores a goal from the point through like eight people to make it three nothing and still can't hit an open net to save his life. But that was his 100th career NHL goal. Congrats to him. Yeah, good job. And, well, I mean, I don't know if he got it that night, but he either got it that game or the game last night against the Capitals because we're recording on Thursday. 
Uh, first Ranger and Islander, first player to put up 100 points with both teams in the history of the NHL. So that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And the Rangers PK after that game, 31 for their last 32, which was, and of course, the one power play goal we give up in that entire span is against the Devils because of course. And Zabanajad scores into an empty net at the end of the game. Snipe. Yeah, it was a snipe. That was good. Oh, yeah. And Buchnevich, this is why I love him, takes the monkey off Zabanajad's back, rips that shit off, throws it away. Hopefully that gets Zabanajad. I don't know. I don't know if you could. It's an empty net goal. I know it's a goal, but I mean, I don't know if you did the monkey off his well, back. Well, you that. know why I like that goal? I like that goal because Zabanajad had to fight for it. Yeah, he, he had did. to go and battle at the blue line. He had to go and go against a bigger, tougher defender, get, get his stick on the puck and you know, put that in from pretty far out. So, I mean, yes, it's empty net, but he had to work for it. And I think it's a, we, we, we're seeing the confidence improve, you know, since then. I think Tom Wilson came in and, uh, and gave him like a shove at the end, which is a little dirty, but I mean, yeah, you said a tough goal to get, especially from that far out. Yeah. And my last two notes, a uh, good game from Shesterkin and another strong game from Adam Fox as usual. You're, Liam, you're right. I 100% agree with you. He really is developing into a number one D-man. And mm-hmm. two second-round picks. Thank you, Carolina. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. Imagine Carolina's blue line with Adam Fox on it. If he would have just played with them, that's that's the best decor in the league, and that's not even close. But I'm so happy that we have him. And um, let me just say one other thing. You know, Lafreniere, you know, he was – highly touted as a big game player, a guy in big moments who is able to get goals when you really need them. And like you said, Shades, both of his first two goals being game winners, you know, he's shown that he's that type of player. So when he is developed and when he is ready to make an impact, a true impact in the NHL, like that's the guy he's going to be like in the third period, when there's a minute and a half to go and you need a goal, like last night, you're going to go to him. So. I'm interested to see how he starts doing in shootouts when he gets put in those situations. Oh, yeah. I, I think, um, the, I, I, was gonna, first, I was going to say the Rangers, you know, they won that game, but I would have liked to see Quinn put Lafreniere in the shootout against the Flyers. That's yeah. what I was going to say. But they put Kako, good choice. I think you, they might have actually. I mean, the the way it's been, especially the guys that are missing now, hopefully he gets the, gets in there if, if we end up do having to go to a shootout. But um, like you said, I mean, people have been saying he's got two goals in 15 games, whereas a lot of the other guys are, are doing a lot better already. But I forgot exactly what the stat was, but Stamkos had like maybe 12 points his rookie year. And then he went on to score 50, 50 goals a year. He had 60 at most, maybe. Yep. I mean, I wouldn't worry too much about him, how he starts now, but he'll, he'll get there eventually. Yeah, and well, I didn't see the game against the Flyers last night because I was bowling. I bowled a 706, Liam, so that's good. That's good. Nice job. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate it, but I don't know what that means. That means I average. Not a math guy, so how many games is that? He averaged Three. about two thirty-five well, and a third. Two thirty, two forty. Yeah. Two thirty-five point three 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 three. That's but, impressive for bowl that for bowlers. Good. That's very good. Oh, you should, now that we're talking about bowling, my buddy who I bowled against last week, uh, no, last night. I mean, he shot a seven thirty-four last night. Last week. He goes back to back 299, 300, shoots an 835. That's tough. Oh, good. No, good thing I wasn't. I felt so happy for him. Good thing I wasn't bowling him, though, because I would have been so mad. (laughs) We probably would have got murdered. But uh, no, congrats to him. But uh, I was, dude, it was something. It was a sight to see last week. I mean, he just couldn't miss. But. uh, all right, let's move on to the game against the Flyers because I could talk about bowling all day. Another bad night on faceoffs, 36%. Zabanajad, 2 of 14. Otherwise, in he had a strong night, two assists. Uh, Chris Kreider, hat trick. Of course, when he scores a hat trick, the Rangers still lose. That just goes to show you how the season's going. Uh, another strong game from Fox. This is going to become... A weekly occurrence. Another strong game from Fox. Uh, I, my last two notes are Batetto and Hayek apparently didn't have good games. And Brendan's texted in the chat that we're in last night. 
Shesterkin played well, but four goals allowed isn't going to cut it. So you guys can interpret, interpret that how you will. Go ahead. This game was flat out ugly on both ends, quite frankly. Rangers shouldn't have been in this. I mean, there was, I think Brendan mentioned it, there was four or five breakaways in that third period alone against Shisterk and none that he let uh, get through him. So, I mean, Rangers just, just careless. I mean, how can you take three too many men on the ice penalties in the same game? Wait, One they took with a, three? It's either two or three, but I, I it's definitely at least two. Oh, and how do you gosh. let that happen in the last minute of the game? We need to pull your goalie and get sustained offensive pressure. They didn't get a shot on Brian Elliott. I think with their last shot was like three and a half minutes ago. It's ridiculous. And I'm sorry, Woj, you know, I agreed with you before when you said it doesn't fall on Quinn, it falls on the players. But the players came to play tonight. That's a coaching oh, yeah. issue. Yeah. When you have two too many men on the ice penalties and that critical of a situation. Yeah. Man, oh, man. And, you know, just, just ugly. If Kreider's not playing last night – Probably lose four one. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we missed a lot of guys yesterday. I mean, if you want to count, so it was Miller, Hedo, Panarin, and Kako, right? All the other. If you want to count technically D'Angelo because he's not technically on the roster now or whatever. He's uh, did down. you mention Truba? Oh, Truba too. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we're missing over a line of, of players. Um, you know, Crowder got the hat trick, which you know, great. I mean, I think. I know two of the goals. I'm pretty sure all three of the goals are pretty much the same, but that's how important it is when you guys have someone directly in front. Um, I remember before the game I tweeted, it was a video of um, Kreider playing the piano before the game. And I was like, oh, I was like, of course. I was like, now I know we're going to find him if he doesn't show up tonight. But he got a hat trick, so he just told me to go fuck myself. Um, I, actually, I saw a tweet after yeah. that that said, now we just need Boo Nieves on drums. <laughs> yeah. Um, Kevin Hayes had a snipe. Uh, that was awesome to see. It's my guy. But, uh, I mean, yeah, like you said, it's a coaching issue, right? Is that what you said before, Liam? Yeah. yeah I mean, it's, it's a yeah, it would, I mean, they were missing at least four or five guys too. They missed connect Eve Ward, check Braun. I think somebody else I'm missing, but, um, yeah, that's something where like, even some of like Quinn's post game conferences, he says certain things where it's like, oh, well, they shouldn't have been doing this and it happened early on, it's like, well, I get it. You know, it may not have been your part of, you know, you're running the offense and uh, Jock is running the defense. But, I mean, at one point you kind of got to step and be like, hey, if this has happened in the first period, you know, regroup in the, in the intermission and be like, hey, stop this. Let's get get it together. But it seems like he just let it continue throughout the course of the game and didn't, didn't nip it in the butt early. So you said coaching issue. It's one of those games where it's, you know, it's rough. So everyone's got to step up too. Um but other than that, they, they played – I thought they played pretty good. The power play was a little bit better. They went two for five. Um, but it's better than going over for five like they sometimes do. So, and, tough game. You know, tough game, you're right. And here's my thing, right? I know the expectations aren't the same. But if Montreal is going to go out and they're going to fire Claude Julien after, you know, just a little bit of a rough stretch here after the start they had and the Rangers having the start they had as slow as they were, and they come out flat and disor- disorganized like they were last night. I don't know. I understand the Rangers weren't supposed to be a playoff team in this division. I get that, but that's no excuse for poor play. I mean, yeah, I get your thoughts on it, but yeah, I mean, it's tough. And there's a, you know, I, I liked Quinn early on. I thought he was going to be good. Uh, and people say like, oh, he's not developing guys. Guys aren't getting ice time. But when you look at the stats, it looks like they are. Um, but they there's a lot of ki- a lot of guys on the team that have played a lot played a lot better under him or have, you know, like Strom plays at Panarin rejuvenates his career a little bit, but like all the young guys have been doing pretty well under him. Um, I don't know. I think people have too many expectations for some of the young guys that it's, that they think it falls on the coach, but I mean, at, at one point it, it's a, it's a group, it's a group thing that everyone's got to step up together and, you know, something's going to happen to, to spark the team. And, you know, if it's a coaching change and, you know, so be it, but if not, they got to do something to, to wake them up and be a lot more consistent. Yeah, here's my thoughts on Quinn. I mean, you look at guys like Lindgren, Fox, look at how well Miller's playing right off, right out of the gate. hedel has been a lot better this season. kako has been a monster compared to what he was doing last season. So there are a bunch of young guys that are developing and developing pretty damn well. The quest, 
the main problem is, especially under Quinn, when the top six is going, the bottom six is nowhere to be found. When the bottom six is going, the top six is nowhere to be found. So I don't know. It's some type of balancing act that I'm too stupid to understand because no, it's reasonable. It's look, fine. if your top players aren't playing like your top players, that's fine. That falls on them. David Quinn should have to reap none of those repercussions. But like I said, these are play. Look, I don't know about you guys. Out of the last couple of Rangers coaches that they've had, right? You know, you look at Elaine Vigneault, you look at John Tortorella. That that wouldn't happen under them. Like the amount of too many men on the ice penalties during David Quinn's tenure, I would love to see that statistic because I guarantee that it's more combined than Tortorella and Vigneault had uh, while they were coaching the Rangers. It's mental. It's mental mistakes. It can't happen. It's like not having your team ready to go while you know waiting for their line. I, I just. That irks me. If your goaltending doesn't play well, you know, if you come out flat, if you're going east west instead of north south, fine. You know, that falls on the players. This falls on the coach. And there's some accountability to be had here. And if the Rangers want to win, if you want to get a, a high draft pick, if you want to go for Owen Power and test your lottery luck again, then keep David Quinn. But if you want to win and if you want to fight for that four spot, then go for it. And, and you know, guys, like I was saying before, I think that the Rangers are a better team than the Penguins. I think we're a better team than the Sabres. I think we're a better team than the Devils, you know, even though our record against them doesn't really prove that. And look, I think the Capitals are a depleted team. I think that they're a shell of their former selves. I do not think that they're properly coached with Peter Laviolette. That's going to be an unpopular opinion, but it's just the way I, I, I look at it. And I think that the Rangers can sneak in here. And, you know, the mentality has to be about winning and the mentality has to be about playing smart hockey. And uh, I don't think David Quinn's doing that right now, so. It just depends what Jeff Gordon and John Davidson want to have out of their club. Do you want to, you know, build a losing culture or a winning one? I hate to say it, but that's how frank it is sometimes. Yeah, it is. It is wild to see how many times they get a, a too many men penalty. I mean, I, I don't I don't like to compare it to this, but like I've I played over 10 years. I swear to God, I think maybe within a season we've gotten three. He gets like two a game. So I like it's unbelievable that how many times that, that they get the bench the bench minor, and uh, yeah, it shows how much control they don't have. Um, like you said, the rest of the teams I already saw it as um, like the reason why Pittsburgh has uh, who do they hire? They hired Hextall and Burke. Yep. yep. The reason why they hire them is because they notice that this team is, is going down down the tube. There, there's no future for them anymore. Crosby and, and Malkin are getting older. Um, like you said Washington's getting older too. Um, the only teams on the uprising are Buffalo, Jersey, and they're not even coming close to competing yet. Whereas I thought we were a lot better last year too. Um, but yeah, we, we can be a top three team and it's just that this team needs to wake up and, and get the shit together and get it moving. Yeah. The only reason that I didn't have this team pegged for a playoff spot is because we're still in the middle of a rebuild. We still don't have Niels Lundqvist. We still don't have craps off. I mean, Miller was a surprise out of camp. Uh, Fox and Lindgren were good last season. Their continued development is has been a success so far. We didn't know how far ahead Kako was going to be compared to last season. Uh, we didn't know how much Hedl was going to develop. There was just too many question marks. This is Shesterkin's first full season, albeit a shortened season as the team's goalie and there was just too many question marks and that's why I'm just like this team is getting a pass from me but at the same time just like all these penalties all these blown leads all these heartbreaking losses it just it still kills me and you know guys I mean here's how I look at it right you got to look at the bright side if this was going to happen any season I'm glad that it is a 56 game season and not a 82 game season, right? At least we don't have to endure it for too long and we can get back to starting fresh in October. That's when it really matters. If the Rangers don't show up when we start in October, then you can be worried. Liam, I have been telling that to so many people. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is seriously. And if you have to mortgage this season to having a not a worse off record than you've had in the last couple of years, you're able to get a draft pick. Hey, 
add another prospect into this pool. We will welcome it. We need more. You know, everyone said, oh, we're getting rid of Jesper Foss because we have too many wingers with Kreider and Lafreniere. Wow, wouldn't we just love to have Jesper Foss right now? Kind wouldn't of. we? Yeah. I would. Of. You know, yep. so. Yeah. You never have too much season. depth, boys. Yeah. If there was a season to just nail it in, I mean, it, just see how it is the next, you know, 15 games. If nothing's improved, it's still – Win, loss, 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 win, you know, for still shit in the bed. I'd say mail it in, just try to get another prospect, maybe package it up together and try to get somebody down the summer. But Or hold on to him, see what you can get. If you can, you know, like you said, if we get all in power, if we get lucky enough, you know, he could probably step in right away. Um, but, yeah, like you said, there's a perfect time to do it. It's this season, not an 82 game one. Everything's back to normal. Yeah, and hopefully everything gets back to normal before October, but time will tell on that one. But uh, no, like you guys were just saying, if we, if Liam, you said it, but if it comes true again, I mean, I, I might have to celebrate with another White Castle and another fast food extravaganza that I already that's, have planned for later this season. That's what but, you did? Oh, no, no, no. On May 8th, me and my buddy are literally... Let me just let me just show you. We have an itinerary planned of food to get throughout the day. I'm pretty wow. sure you just White Castle thing with Brendan because that's not real meat. That's like street meat. That's like garbage found on the side of the road. But no, I mean I still like White Castle. It's still good. Whatever they do, they taste good. But yeah, no, it's fine. In the morning on May eighth, me and my buddy literally have this Dunkin' cold brews in the morning because of the Pasternak commercials, which are fucking fantastic, by the way. Uh, for lunch, we have gyros from this place, Fontana on Francis Lewis Boulevard. Also, the gyros are really good at that place. We have White Castle mozzarella sticks as a snack. We have Cherry Valley for dinner. And then for dessert, <laughs> Eddie Sweet Shop. <laughs> Dude, we've been planning this out for like a year. I can't wait. I can't wait. And Why are you on this? Oh, because it's May 8th. Oh, the last day of the regular season. Oh. oh okay. Yeah. Just a quick backstory. We're doing this, guy, this so. we're doing this on the sole basis because me and my buddy Dan, that's who I'm doing it with, we joked about if the Rangers fired Lindy Ruff one and they got the first overall pick, Lafreniere, we were gonna do this. Then both of those things actually happened. And I shot him a text afterward. You do realize we have to do this now, right? And he's like, yep. So May 8th, can't wait. It's a crazy sequence of events, you know? Yeah. Certainly unforeseen. (laughs) Oh, hell yeah. Dude, I can't wait, man. That's going to be, I mean, it's not going to be fun, like probably later on in the night, but it'll be fun throughout the day. (laughs) You're going to be glued onto the bowl. Maybe. Fun. Yeah. Oh, no, for sure. Hey, I still can't wait, though. That's It's it's always good going down. It sounds fun. Yeah. Yeah, and of course, we didn't have a brew this episode, of course. Yeah, it's a Thursday. We're responsible podcasters. We don't drink during the week. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you know what? That's fair enough. I would have got coffee, but I had my two cups earlier. Brennan wants to get the non-alcoholic beer, but that kind of defeats the purpose. I mean, it's still yeah. a brew, but I don't know. I don't know. Well, next week, next week, I promise I'll have one. If you're going to have non-alcoholic beer, you might as well just, like, drink coffee. Yeah. <laughs> That's just my personal opinion. Like I said, I don't drink. so. But when the Rangers eventually win the Stanley Cup, if, hopefully when, oh, we're, I'm getting loaded. I'm getting loaded. <laughs> and both of you are invited to that. <laughs> I, I can't wait. I want to see it. I really do. You're going to be lit after like a fucking Bud Light. Maybe. I don't know. Depends. Maybe you might be, might be gone. I might be. We're getting your stomach pumped. If it's not from the White Castle, it's from the beer. I hope it doesn't have to come to that. But... It might. They won the cup. Uh, yeah, that's true. I mean, and you know, that's just a quick point I just wanted to bring up, right? Everybody on the Rangers Twitter, you know, they're all so focused on bringing this team back to cup contention. Hey, it might take us until 
2023. It might take us until 2024, you know, because Niels Lundqvist, you know, I come in next year. He's not going to come in. He's not going to be like, you know, that number one, number two, even a second pair defenseman right out of the gate. Right. You know, you might have to wait a couple of years. You might have to wait two, three years, you know, like Fox was developing while he wasn't signed in Carolina. Right. So, you know, the prospects are all so young. It's not like we have a core that is in their prime that it's win a Stanley Cup or bust. No, in three, four years, Kreider's going to be okay. He's going to be a little bit slower. He's going to be deep into that contract, but he's still going to be big on the power play, you know? So uh, just think about how good the decor Fox and Miller are going to be in three years. Like we could come a long way oh, yeah. from where we are right now. We are just scratching the surface as an organization coming out of this. So temper expectations. Yeah, I don't remember if I said it earlier in the episode or as we were talking before I started recording, but I said my least favorite Rangers team because we were having that discussion was the post-2018 deadline team. If you look at that roster and you look at the roster they currently have, the rebuild has already come a very long way. They still have a little bit to go, but it's come so much further along than people realize. Yep trying to think of the lineup post-2018 trade deadline. Let me give like you a, a hint. Shea Sproul, or Sproul, Sproul, whatever his name was, that was literally our first defense pairing. Oh, my goodness. Fucking terrible. I should have brought. I should have looked for this picture earlier. Who, Camper, one of them? He might have been. Uh, Holden, Camper. Uh, Rob O'Gara. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah Rob O'Gara. Those were not fun times. No. Uh, I, I, you know what I should have did? I should have looked for the picture I had earlier because it's going to take me forever, and I'm not going to start just wasting people's time over here. But uh, make fun yeah. of the next episode. John Gilmore, Ryan Spooner. <laughs> oh my God. David DeHarnay, remember the days? David, oh, oh I remember David DeHarnay. Dustin Tokarski, I think, got his starter too with us. <laughs> Vinny Latiri, Frederick oh Clayson, God. who I think was underrated. Yeah, he was good. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, that's just a, that's a shell of this current Rangers team. Yeah, seriously. Cody McLeod on the fourth line. Peter Holland. All these guys bringing back a lot of memories. Jeez. Adam McQuaid. Got a third round pick for him. From, uh, uh, no, not third round pick. No, a fourth I'm and a seventh. Out. It was a fourth and a seventh a fourth and Columbus, a... but then he just retired right after, so it's okay. Yeah, that was uh, that was not fun to watch. But <laughs> you you want to know the sad part out of all of that? That was when Spooner was actually playing really well. <laughs> hey, you know what? It boosted his trade value and got us Brian Strom. So I'm not upset. Say what you want about Strom; he's been productive. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. I'd much rather have him than Spooner. <laughs> oh yeah, so isn't I don't think Spooner's even in the league anymore. He's not even in the country. I think he's playing overseas. Yeah. Yeah, he's nice. in Europe. <laughs> yeah, you want to know who I wish was still on the team, but unfortunately, like his play just deteriorated. Kevin freaking Klein, baby. You were saying Hayes. I missed Kevin Klein, man. Yeah, he was good. He's like a better version of Jacob Truba. <laughs> that's kind of tough to say because Drew was making $8 million a season for the next six yeah. years, so seven years. Yeah, but... Uh, but we're missing him in this lineup. I wish we had him back. Oh, yeah. Just yes. goes to show, right? Yes, we definitely are. Well, we will be back with Pucks and Brews, and unfortunately, we could not have a brew this episode because, you know, people got to work in the morning. But uh, we will be back with episode six on monday no excuse me tuesday march 9th because we'll be recording monday march 8th uh i'm hoping panarin is either close to returning or hopefully back by that point it would be very nice considering the state the team is in uh in that span we will be playing looks like five games boston boston buffalo new jersey New Jersey, Pittsburgh. That was six games, right? Yeah, I think so. All right. I had to take one out of two from Boston. If we can yeah. take one out of two from Boston, hopefully we can beat Buffalo. 
We've beat Hopefully. the good teams and shit the bed against the bad teams. Yeah. If we can take one Funniest game thing. against New Jersey, I'll call that a success at this point. Yeah. And yeah. Pittsburgh. Got to win. You never know with that team, with the Rangers. So. Yeah. We were Filipino crossbar in overtime from beating them the first time. Yeah. So Pittsburgh's not that good, guys. Just saying. No, I, think, I, uh, I didn't have them making the playoffs, I don't yeah. think. Or did I? I don't know. But I, I, one thing I'll say before we end it, but uh, I think – I mean, I, I hope maybe they call me from Hartford because I don't think I watch Jack Johnson anymore. Or Potato's been okay, so is Hayek, but maybe give like Rune and Tarmo a, a, a chance or a look. See anybody else down there that's been a little bit better. Especially in a season like this, you might as well. You, you're not going to – I don't think you're stopping anybody's growth from, from throwing them in for a game or two and see how they do. Yeah. Yeah, I think they need to bring up Tarmo. I agree. Bring some extra good. life to that defense score. Because ever since he came over, you know, he's acclimated pretty pretty well to the AHL, right? So, And also, I think you got to look somewhere else other than Johnny Brzezinski for the yeah. fourth line winger. Yeah. Took a bad penalty last night. And, uh, yeah, just not effective. Nope. They didn't catch lightning in the bottle like they did with Colin Blackwell. So. Yeah. yeah, no, he's actually been a sneaky good signing. So is Rooney. Yeah, Rooney's been good. I like Rooney a lot. I think I was kind of a little bit perplexed, but, like, there's an argument to be made that Rooney, outside of Panarin, has been the Rangers' best forward this season. And yeah. I'm not joking. <laughs> if you think about it. No, that's a – he's definitely in contention. I mean, he's, the only, he's consistent every yeah, game. The only other him. person who's even in contention is Kreider because he's actually scored, like, six or seven at this point. Yeah. But – no, I would mostly agree with you there. Yeah. Which is sad because he's making 700000 and the guy's making millions outside of Panera and having well, to do and Jack. Here's the other thing, right? Rooney's the only guy on the team who can win a goddamn faceoff. I mean, seriously. Yeah. I mean, the fact that you have uh, to put out your fourth line center in crunch time with your goalie pulled, come on. Yeah. Like, oh, Strom is just abysmal. Strom just should become a winger at this point. <laughs> Yeah, Zabanajad is hot and cold in the faceoff circle. Howden is somehow our best faceoff man. And Heedle, his percentage was terrible. But, dude, I'm telling you, if a year from now, Alexander Barkov hits the free agent market, if, and I'm hoping he does, the Rangers need to literally say, here's a blank check, write any mm. number you want on it. <laughs> yeah. Wow, Barkov with Panarin would just be – and look, correct me, correct me if I'm wrong, right? But if the Rangers uh, buy out Tony D'Angelo because he, he's under the age of 27, they wouldn't have to pay his salary. They wouldn't have to have it on the on the cap hit. So that's clearing up what four and a half million. Yeah. Well, I mean, it'd be a dead cap at like three hundred and change thousand this year or next year, I should say. And the following year was like eight hundred thousand or something. Well, Barkov could command north of ten million. Like, he could make more than Eichel. Like, that's how good he is. Yeah. Especially I, center. I think it'd be worth it. I mean, I don't know if you – if you have it to trade, and I don't know if you throw Mika in there, if he doesn't pick it up this season. I, I don't want to get rid of him, but if he can't get it together, I'd definitely – I'd rather pay Barkov 11, 10 or 11, than pay Mika 7 or 8, and then try to find something for Strom. Yeah, the main reason I brought this up is because, one, Barkov is – he has a very good face-off percentage. He's very good defensively, arguably in the Selkie conversation. And the guy can put up 70 points pretty consistently. In my opinion, that's worth 10, 11 million. Yeah. Yeah. The only problem I have with it is you don't want to become the Maple Leafs, right? You don't want to have $21 million locked into ten pl- uh, two players with Panarin and, uh, and Barkov. But... Well, in their case, it's 22.6. <laughs> I think it's north of 30, actually. Yeah. I think, I think it's it that is. much because you got Marner making 11 and a half. You got Matthews making 10 and a half. You have Nylander making 6.75. Like, that's $26 million in two players right there. And it's not even including John Tavares, who's making another $10 million. So you can make that $36 million in four players when the team's real struggle is defense. But it's a conversation for another day, right? We, yeah. we could get lucky with the way – Akaka didn't have a strong rookie season. He's picking it up this year, but who knows what his stat, stats end up. When it comes up to con, uh, contract extension, 
there's a chance we may be able to get him for a good deal. And then Loft, depending on how he does, and he, he kind of strikes me as like a, you know, I mean, other than like the McKinnon comparison and, and Crosby, I wouldn't be surprised if he's one of those guys that takes less money to, you know, help out the team. And that would maybe give us a good shot at signing a number one center. I know it's or early. I know it's early, but Lafreniere's trajectory as a rookie is reminding me of Nathan McKinnon. And, you know, Nathan McKinnon came into this league and he did not light the league on fire. It was not until year three that McKinnon really blew up. It was not until year four or five when he got established as one of the best players in the world. So that's what I'm saying, right? Temper yeah. expectations because Lafreniere might not be great next year or even the year after, but by 2024, he could be a McKinnon type player on this team. So patience, that, that's, that's yeah. the big thing. Patience. This is still a young, we're the youngest team in the league. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But uh, as of now, we just have to uh, sit through the bad and hopefully things get better during the off season because it's going to be a wild off season expansion draft. Then hopefully the draft right after that, if it doesn't get pushed back and then free agency, not yeah. I, it doesn't look like a great crop of free agents, but the Rangers are going to have a lot of cap space freed up. So hopefully the team will be able to sign somebody face off winning center would be nice. But uh, in the meantime, like I said, we're just going to have to sit through the rest of the season and highlight the positive, take the bad in stride, see what we can move on from. But uh, yeah. Any got any last thoughts from you two? Just want to say we sat through that 2018 season and how much of a struggle that was. Oh, and we yeah. ended up getting to last year in 2019, just, you know, just how good the Rangers were. I mean, sure, you add Panarin, and that makes a major difference. But what a difference a year can make. We, we might be sitting here a year from now, and the Rangers might be on the meteoric rise that Colorado went on last year, where we just saw Colorado and we're like, wow, you know, look at that blue line. Like, they got Byram coming up, too, and they have all these other guys. Like, they're going to be ridiculous. And, you know, yep. that that could be where we're headed. And I'm so excited. And it was awesome to join you guys tonight. You guys do a great job every single week. Uh, nice definitely time. check them thank out. You. And uh, thank you so much for having me on. It's a pleasure. Now, uh, now that you said that, thank you, everyone, for listening. Or actually, wait, hold on. Whoa, Jenny, last uh, thoughts? Sorry to cut you off there. No, that's it. No, no. I think we got it in the cupboard. It was good. All right. Thank you, everyone, for listening for episode five of Pucks and Brews. We will be back with episode six, Tuesday, March 9th. Check out our boy Liam right here on the Penalty Box podcast on Apple Podcasts and a bunch of other podcasting platforms. I am your host, Mike Sparacino, joined by Woj as usual. This has been Pucks and Brews. And last, last thought of the episode, for the love of God. Sabanajad, please score a goal. <laughs> yeah. It's coming. It's coming. I, I think it's two this year. He has two, right? I think it's two this year, actually, two. on the empty netters. I have my last words, Brendan. Thanks for showing up. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Brendan. Yeah. <laughs> Hope you're having fun with Kako and Keandre over there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hopefully, he'll be activated off the protocol, the COVID protocol list <laughs> next episode. <laughs>